Yeah, so I'm going to be talking about exoplanets. This is planets around stars other than our own sun. I'm going to start by showing you a little movie, which is the, uh, the one-minute version of my talk. Um, we made a bunch of these here at the OU. You'll probably recognise the voice uh, narrating them. Just take a listen. 60 Second Adventures in Astronomy. Number three, exoplanets. Like fussy holidaymakers looking for a home from home, astronomers are fascinated by finding planets similar to Earth beyond our solar system. But planets outside our solar system, known as exoplanets, are difficult to spot because they get lost in the glare from the star they orbit, like a mosquito flying around a street lamp. So how do you see something that's effectively invisible? Observing the changing appearance of some stars, astronomers found that an exoplanet could be detected by measuring the effect of its gravitational pull on the star it orbits. Some can also be detected if they pass in front of their star, causing its light to dim slightly, like a wink. You can even work out the planet's mass and size from the amount of the star's wobble and the depth of its wink, which gives us a pretty good idea of what it's made of. Some exoplanets may even contain water because they orbit their stars in the Goldilocks zone. Any further away, they'd be too cold. Any closer, too hot. And although hundreds of exoplanets have been discovered, astronomers haven't yet found one that's just like the Earth. Who needs a second home, anyway? Um, if you want to see some more of our 60-second adventures in astronomy, you can find them all on YouTube, so uh, do, uh, do take a look. So, 20 years ago, we didn't know of any planets around other stars. We knew of one solar system, our own, and we know that has four small rocky planets, like the Earth, and four giant gaseous planets, like Jupiter. They're shown to relative size plus other asteroids and comets and minor planets and so on. But that was all we knew of 20 years ago. Now, astronomers have found over a 1,000 exoplanets. A 1,000 planets around other stars have been found in the last uh, 20 years. A few of those are very small, smaller than the Earth or Earth size. An awful lot of them are very large. Now, that's perhaps not surprising. The big ones are easier to find. It's as simple as that. Also, a lot of these gas giant planets that have been found are very close to their stars. They orbit them very rapidly, what we call hot Jupiters, because they're very uh, close, therefore very hot. Now, we see a lot of hot Jupiters. We don't see many Earth-like planets. That's not to say Earth-like planets are rare. It just means they're rather hard to find. And, of course, the goal of all this work, what we'd really like to do, is find another planet like the Earth, somewhere out there in space. And this is uh, just a, a slide that has been put together showing the 10 exoplanets that might be most like the Earth. They're all a little bit larger than the Earth, but we can work out their mass, their size, their temperature, their, their gravity, even their composition to some extent. But of course, these are just artists' impressions. These aren't the real images of the planet. We can't see the planets directly at all. All we ever see is the star that they orbit around, and that star is just a point of light. And I want you to remember that as I show you the, the next uh, bits and pieces about how we do this work. We only ever see the star as a point of light, and yet from that we can infer a lot of this other information about the planets themselves. So the project that I've been involved with, along with several others here at the Open University, is called Super Wasp the Wide Angle Search for Planets. Uh, there's a di uh, photograph of it there. You can see it's a robotic mount with eight camera lenses on it. Here's, here's one of the lenses. You can uh, take a look at that later if, uh, if you hang around at the end. And all we do with SuperWASP is robotically control this telescope and take pictures of the sky. We take pictures of large areas of the sky again and again and again all night every night, and we've been doing that for about 10 years now. So the sort of image we obtain in the uh, top right there contains maybe 10, no, maybe 100,000 stars. And all we do with those images is measure the brightness of every star on every image. And then we link together those brightness measurements over time so that we can see how the brightness of every star 
varies from minute to minute, from hour to hour, from night to night, month to month, year to year. And since we began operating Super Wasp in 2004, we have one installation in the Northern Hemisphere, in La Palma in the Canary Islands, one in the Southern Hemisphere in South Africa, so we can see the whole sky. In the last 10 years, we've collected about 12 million images. From those 12 million images, we've extracted about 400 billion data points, which we string together to make brightness measurements, so-called light curves, of about 30 million stars. So we've measured how the brightness of 30 million stars varies with time. And that is how we discover exoplanets. Because if we happen to be observing the system such that the planet passes in front of its star from our viewpoint, then the planet will block a tiny fraction of the starlight. A Jupiter-sized planet passing in front of a sun-sized star would block 1% of the light. So the light will dip by 1%. So all we have to do is look through those 30 million light curves, looking for the ones where the light curve is dipping, winking at us to tell us there's a planet orbiting the star. And so far, with SuperWASP, we've found about 100 transiting exoplanets, about a quarter of the known ones that transit. What can we measure from that? Remember, just a point of light. Well, by seeing how often the dip repeats, we can work out how long it takes the planet to orbit the star the length of the planet's year. From that, we can work out how far away from the star the planet is. So we can work out the temperature of the planet. From the depth of the dip, we can work out the size of the planet. This particular one, shown in the bottom right there, WASP-4, has a 2.25% dip. Turns out that planet is rather bigger than Jupiter. Also, from the width of the dip, we can work out the angle that we're viewing the orbit. Remember, it's just a point of light Yet from that sort of data, we can work out the size of the planet, the angle of the orbit, the time the planet takes to go around the star, the distance of the planet from the star, and the temperature of the planet, just from a point of light. But that's not all. If we found planets in that way, we can then go and look at them in a different way, with a spectrograph. We look at the spectrum of the star. As the planet orbits the star, so the gravity of the planet tugs the star backwards and forwards. The star wobbles slightly backwards and forwards. As it wobbles towards us, its light gets Doppler shifted, shifted towards the blue. As the star wobbles away from us, it lights, its light gets red shifted. So as the planet orbits the star, the star wobbles backwards and forwards, its spectrum gets slightly bluer and slightly redder. From the amplitude of that wobble, we can work out the mass of the planet. The sort of wobble we measure, it's easy relatively easy these days, to measure a Doppler shift of 10 meters per second. That's about the speed Usain Bolt runs. Imagine Usain Bolt running towards you. With the sort of spectrographs we have, we could measure the blue shift of Usain Bolt. As he runs away from us, we could measure his red shift. The challenge is to measure the Doppler shift due to an Earth-sized planet orbiting a Sun-like star in an Earth-like orbit. That would give a Doppler shift of about 1 meter per second, walking speed. Now, as I walk towards you in a way, you can't see me getting bluer and redder, but that's the sort of Doppler shift we need to measure to find Earth-like planets. So, from the magnitude of this Doppler shift, we can work out the mass of the planet. I said from the transit observations, we can already work out the size of the planet. So, if we know the mass of the planet and the size of the planet, we can work out the density of the planet, so we can tell whether it's made of rock or gas. Remember, just a point of light that we're seeing, yet we can work out the mass of the planet, the size of the planet, the density of the planet, what it's made of, how long its year lasts, how far away from the star it is, what temperature it is, just from a point of light. But we can do even better than that. As the planet passes in front of the star, some of the star's light reaches us through the planet's atmosphere. So the chemical signature of the planet's atmosphere is imprinted on the spectrum of the star. If we can examine that spectrum very closely and see signatures of chemicals like oxygen, ozone, carbon dioxide, water, methane, that might indicate that there was life on that planet. So I'll just finish up with this picture. This is a random patch of space containing a few 10,000 stars. It now seems pretty certain 
that most stars in the galaxy have planets orbiting them. Perhaps as many as one in three of the sun-like stars has an Earth-like planet that could be capable of supporting life. If we're going to find the signature of life elsewhere in the universe, I believe it will come from these studies of transiting exoplanets. People have been listening out for, for radio waves from you know, extraterrestrial intelligence. I don't think we're going to find extraterrestrial life that way. If it exists, I think we'll find it from the spectral signature of a planet passing in front of a star when we see that that planet's atmosphere contains gases that we associate with life. That life may be just a green slime that you could uh, scrape off a rock with your finger, but it would still be life. And I think if life exists elsewhere in the galaxy, we will find it within the next 20 years by this technique. And that's going to be the sort of time when some of you will be studying astronomy, physics, space science at university. One of you could be the first person to find evidence of life elsewhere in the universe. So I'll finish on that and just say, watch this space. Thank you.